Open your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 8. Matthew, chapter 8. Last Sunday, I reminded us of God's word, saying, 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Today, I want you to notice Matthew chapter 8. Begin reading in verse 23 and reading through verse 26. Matthew 8, 23 through 26. And when he, Christ, was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves but he Christ was asleep these many of these men were fishermen they had been fishing on the sea of Galilee all of their lives their fathers were fishermen their grandfathers were fishermen They knew that sea. They knew what storms were like. They knew what bad weather was like. They knew what strong winds were like and high waves were like. These were not novices when it came to sailing. The Bible says there rose a great tempest insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. Jesus was sound asleep. The great storm on the sea that threatened to sink the ship that Jesus was in caused him so little concern that Jesus was sleeping straight through it. And his disciples including these seasoned, brave fishermen, came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. This had to be a horrific storm. These brave sailors felt like they were about to die. They believed the ship was going to sink. The storm was going to capsize the boat. They feared for their lives. They were in the middle of a horrific, life-threatening storm. What did Jesus say to them? Oh, you're right. We better do something, guys. Come on. What, what What do we do? What do we do? Jesus said, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Why are you fearful? Here's why you're fearful. You have little faith. The only reason that we fear anything is because we are people of little faith. When your faith is small, your fear is great. When your faith is great, your fear is small. (laughs) 
America has a fear problem and Christians have a faith problem. Why are you fearful? Well, well, look around. The waves are crashing on the ship. The ship is tossing and turning it. We're taking on water. What do you mean, why are we fearful? What do you mean, ye of little faith? Because the God that holds us in the palm of his hand is greater than any storm, any wind, any wave we will ever face. So if you're afraid, it means you have forgotten that. Or you have chosen to ignore that. Or you have chosen to walk by sight and not by faith. Four times the Bible tells us, the just shall live by faith. If the Bible says it once, we need to listen to it. If he says it twice, we need to really listen to it. If he says it three times, if he says it four times, God doesn't repeat things that are not important. The just shall live by faith. Why are ye fearful? O ye of little faith. Don't you know who is with you in this boat? Why do you think I'm down there sleeping? Do you have any idea? Who is with you in this storm? I'm the one that made these winds. I'm the one that made these waves. I'm the one that made this water. I'm the one that created all of this. Have you forgotten who's with you in this storm? And I say to you, And I say to all of you, have you forgotten who is with you in this storm? Do you think this caught God by surprise? You think God is unprepared to deal with not only the situation in general, but in your life and in mine specifically? Have you forgotten who is with you in the storm? I think a lot of you have. A lot of you have forgotten who is in this storm with us. Lovingly, I say, shame on you. As Christians... We should not be of the same susceptibility to the terrors of this world as those who know not Christ. What do we have to offer an unsaved world if we cannot stand bravely, courageously, with faith in God in the worst of times? What do we have? What do we have to offer the unsaved world? If we cower in fear as they do, if we are intimidated as they are, if we are as fearful as, what do we have to offer them? How is what we have any different than what anybody else has? If we cannot stand in the midst of the storm with courage and bravery, Look at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Turn it if you can find it quickly. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. I want to show you this one. Oh. <laughs> Hold on to your seat. 
Look what Jesus said in Revelation 21 in verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What's the first type of person named in that list? The fearful. The fearful shall have their part in the lake of fire. The fearful are put in the same category as abominable and murderers and whoremongers and idolaters and liars. The fearful, the fearful, the fearful. The fearful are putting out the sign. Those who are prone to fear are putting out the sign that they are the ones who are marked for damnation. They are giving off the signal, I'm not among the redeemed. I am as murderers and liars and abominable and, I, and, and unbelieving. I am as whoremongers and sorcerers. And I will share the same fate as they. The fearful shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. How we respond to fear is a test of the reality and the veracity of our Christian profession. Amen. It's one thing to say you're a Christian when it doesn't cost you anything to be a Christian. But when you're looking in the face of fear, when you're looking in the face of threats and intimidation, that's when you will prove to yourself that you are the child of God and not part of those who are of perdition. Courage is not something that you build up. It's not something that you have to get in a group and everybody go rah, 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 and, and, and get all this, you know, hoo, 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 and drink some whiskey and put some drug in your vein and hoo, 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 and then go attack the enemy. That's not courage. Amen. Courage is something that we receive from God himself. Amen. It is a gift of God because we are of him. We are his children. His spirit lives within us. And so, it's not something we work up. It's something that is just within us. And whenever it becomes necessary for that part of the Spirit's blessing in our lives to manifest itself, it manifests itself naturally. These people that are cowering in fear 
are giving out signals that they do not belong to the God of heaven. They're giving out signals that they're part of the fallen race of men as are murderers and abominable and whoremongers and sorcerers and all the rest of the fallen race. You say you're a Christian. Well, then this shouldn't be a problem. This shouldn't be a problem. Proverbs 3.25, you don't have to turn to it. I gave this verse to you last week. Be not afraid of sudden fear when it cometh. Be not afraid of sudden fear when it cometh. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. You remember that verse? Well, I'm here to tell you, and I don't have to tell you because you already know this, the powers and spiritual wickedness in high places are using the threat of the coronavirus to implant fear and panic into the hearts of men. Amen. Let me give you a little history of the virus. The virus was identified in the 1960s. In the 1960s, as a frequent cause of respiratory infections, approximately one third of the common colds stem from this virus. Did you hear me? This has been around since the 1960s, at least the discovery of it. We know that at least a third of all common colds stem from the coronavirus. To this point, there has been no way of knowing whether the people said to have the coronavirus actually have the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 or other strands of the virus. No doubt the vast majority of the people that are said to have the coronavirus do not have COVID-19. If a test is given and it comes back coronavirus, that is the old strand of the coronavirus known to medical science since the 1960s. Here's the thing you gotta, we, America and the state of Montana is included in this, do not to this moment have the up-to-date testing kits to determine if someone has COVID-19. You get a test and it says, oh, you have the coronavirus. What test are they using to tell you that you have the coronavirus? The states don't even have those testing mechanisms available in the entire state. Montana doesn't have the testing equipment to test for the COVID-19 virus. They do have plenty of testing for the old standard coronavirus, which may be prompting bad colds, it could be prompting the flu. Has anybody here ever had the flu? See your hand. Okay, looks like most of us. I had the flu once, many years ago. And no, I do not and will not take the flu vaccine. But many, many, many years ago, I had 
the flu virus. That was when we lived in Florida. And I got to tell you, I was sick. I was sick. It was a bad bout. I felt, I had fever, I ached everywhere. It, it, it was just for about three days, it was really bad. It was the flu. The flu can make you feel bad. The flu can kill you. More people are going to die in 2019 from the old-fashioned flu than from the coronavirus. 18,000 people, as I told you last week, since September, six months in the last six months, 18,000 people in America have died from the flu. Nobody panics over the flu. Why? Because the media and the government have not hyped the flu. They've hyped coronavirus. They don't even have, for the most part, they're going to get testing equipment. This is part of the, the new budget that was just the emergency budget. And so the states are eventually, over the next several weeks and months, they're going to have the testing equipment to test specifically for the COVID-19. But they don't have that now! And I guarantee you, China, whose medical expertise especially for the common people, it does not come close to the proficiency of the medical community in the United States of America. So when China says we have this many, when Italy says we have this many, whenever, uh, whatever the country says, we have this many coronaviruses, there is no way they can tell us that that is the COVID-19 virus. They don't know. It could be a strand of coronavirus that's been around for over 50 years. It's making people ill. Nothing new about that. The fact is, they are saying something of which they have no definitive knowledge. And the media and the government are taking it and exploiting it. And every day we are lambasted with coronavirus scaremongering news stories to frighten the American people into thinking that if they get the coronavirus, they're surely going to die and everybody's going to get it. And you hear all these things like two million people are going to die in America from the coronavirus. So that's the first thing you need to understand. When you hear them say X number of people have the coronavirus, that doesn't mean they have COVID-19. It doesn't mean it. They don't know it. And fact is, the vast majority do not have COVID-19. They have the old-fashioned, the old strain of coronavirus, which may give them colds, may give them the flu, whatever. It's not COVID-19, most of it, and they can't even know at this stage whether it is or isn't. Let me give you another fact. Over 80% of those infected with the coronavirus show only mild symptoms. I want you to listen to this message. 80% of people who have contracted the coronavirus have only mild symptoms. Give you another fact. Coronavirus has a cure rate of 99.7% for those under 50. 99.7% cure rate right now for those that are under 50. 
overall, the survival rate of those infected with the coronavirus is 98%. So that's including even people that are older than 50. All age groups, all categories. The survival rate is 98%. In the first place, you have a minuscule chance of contracting the coronavirus. Secondly, if you do contract it, you have an 80% chance that the symptoms are going to be mild. Thirdly, you have a 98% chance that the coronavirus is not going to kill you. Coronavirus has a contagion factor of two. SARS, remember that one? Had a contagion factor of four. The measles has a contagion factor of 18. I'm just trying to show you that the spread of the coronavirus or the potential spread of the coronavirus does not even come close to matching other diseases with measles as an example being nine times greater than coronavirus. You ready for some more? Oh, I know you're not getting this on CNN or Fox News. And you're not getting it on most Patriot websites either, unfortunately. Our Patriot, so-called Patriot friends, are as culpable as the mainstream media in fomenting fear in the hearts of the American people. And I say to them, shame on you. Shame on you. In China, and by the way, I'm not even going to address in this in this message, the cause. Who caused it? Why was it caused? Was it natural? Was it man-made? Was it China? Was it the United States? I'm not even going to get into that. It doesn't matter. For our discussion here, it doesn't matter. In China, where this thing supposedly started, I'm talking about even in Wuhan, China, the mortality rate from the coronavirus you know what the mortality rate over there in Wuhan, China is for the coronavirus? 0.4%. 0.4% mortality rate from the coronavirus in China. On the Princess cruise ship off Japan, you remember that one? Oh, how can we not? You know what the mortality rate was? And by the way, the worst thing in the world you can do, if there is any kind of a virus, I don't care what kind it is, any, any contagious virus, the worst thing you can do is quarantine people. Because all you do then is put the virus in a small, compact area, and anybody who doesn't have it is almost sure to get it. I mean, that's the worst thing in the world you can do. Is quarantine people. Anyway, on the Princess cruise ship off Japan, you know what the mortality rate was? 0.85%. Ooh, we're all gonna die. 0.4 in China, 0.85 on the cruise ship. In Germany, 0.2%. Globally, the mortality rate for the coronavirus is under 1%. It's under 1%. But the way the news media treats this, the way the government treats this, the way these sensationalized, hyperbolic broadcasters associate this, you would think that the whole world is going to die. Mass depopulation of the world. Really. 
0.4% in China, 0.85% on the cruise ship where everybody supposedly was sick. Germany, 0.2%. Globally, under 1% mortality rate. Have you noticed something? In almost every election year of this century, there has been a virus scare. And almost every election, let me give you a little history. 2004, SARS was going to kill all of us. 2008, the avian flu was going to kill us. 2010, it was the swine flu. 2012, MERS. 2014, Ebola. 2016, Zika. 2018, Ebola again. 2020, Corona. Every election year, we're all going to die. It's amazing how these viruses never show up in the odd years. <laughs> Consider the odds of something else other than the coronavirus taking your life. So far, 12 Americans have died from the coronavirus. That's the last stat I've heard. But since September, over 30 million Americans have contracted the flu. You heard it right, 30 million. And 18,000 have died. Every year, over 50,000 people, I'm talking about, this is just the United States. It's not globally. In the United States, 18,000 people have died so far in the last six months. 50,000 die every year from the flu. Where's the panic over the flu? On average, over 40,000 people die every year in car accidents. You have a far greater risk of dying on Highway 2 or Highway 93 than you do dying from the coronavirus. 40,000 every year die in car accidents. On average, 48,000 people die every year from cardiac disease heart attacks, strokes, etc. 48,000 people every year. You have a far greater chance of dying of cardiac arrest or another cardiac disease than you do dying of the coronavirus. Why aren't we, why aren't we paranoid about our heart condition? On average, over 35,000 people die in accidental falls, falling in the bathtub, for example. 35,000 people every year die in an accidental fall. Suffocation by ingestion, choking on food, kills over 5,000 people every year. I don't know anybody who's afraid to eat. Oh, I don't know if I can eat that steak or not. Oh, 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 that hamburger might choke me to death. I don't know if I can stand it. Those French fries. Oh, no, none of you do that. Gobble it down, man. Five thousand people a year die choking on their food. I'm just trying to put this in perspective for you. I'm trying to get you to use your mind and your brain a little bit and think about why none of these other things are worthy of making us afraid, but all of a sudden this is something that we must be terrified of. Let me ask you a question. If you've asked this to yourself, who benefits from all of this fear and panic. Who benefits from the fear and panic? I'm gonna tell you who benefits. Number one, the main beneficiary, the first beneficiary, the international bankers. Amen. The international bankers. Two weeks ago, and I told you this last week, Trump signed an $8.3 billion aid package to fight the virus. 
I told you this last week as well, 7.8 billion of the 8.3, that's pretty much all of it, was marked discretionary appropriations. It can go anywhere they want to spend it, no strings attached, no accountability, discretionary appropriations. I told you last Sunday, you remember? I said, this is another bailout for bankers. Amen. Remember me telling you that? Well, th today, since last Sunday, what I'm about to tell you has taken place. The Fed, the Federal Reserve, is busy bailing out the major banks by increasing support of short-term repurchase agreements to the tune of $174 billion a day. $174 billion a day. Think back 2008 and 2009 with 9-11 and the bailouts. TARP was created, Troubled Asset Relief Program, relief for the bankers, not for you and me, but for the bankers. The bailout, the total bailout of the banks under TARP, 2008 and 2009, No, it's not 9-11. That would be the, the, the great recession that collapsed. That was spawned by 9-11. It wasn't 9 11 I misspoke. You know what I'm talking about? The, the crash of 2008 and 2009. Were 800 billion. That was the total. That was the total that we were, that we were given. That was the total that Congress was told the total that was on paper. In truth, the total number of bailouts in 2008 and 2009 was 16 trillion dollars. Just this week, it was announced that the banks, these same international banks, what they call the major banks, are receiving $500 billion a week. $500 billion a week. The total, are you, are you following me? I may have confused you because I misspoke. The total in 2008 and 2009 was $800 billion. Now it's 500 billion per week. So if 16 trillion was the total, the true total in 2008 and 9, you can imagine what the true total is in 2020. So 174 billion for the short-term repurchase agreements every day, 500 billion a week under TARP. All this is going to the major banks. The major banks are reaping a, a whirlwind of profits, courtesy of the U.S. taxpayer, prop, courtesy of deficit spending, money that they don't even have, printed out of thin air by the Federal Reserve. Who is the beneficiary of this Virus scare, the international banks. Who is the beneficiary? The welfare state. The welfare state. A bill was passed by the House this past Friday. President Trump has already said that he will sign it. The Senate will pass it on Monday or Tuesday. This is a monstrosity. It is a monstrosity of welfare spending 
two-week paid medical leave, three-month paid family leave, enhanced unemployment insurance, more food aid, more food stamps, increased federal funds for free health care, expands Medicaid benefits, on and on and on. The giveaway from Washington, D.C. is exploding as a result of this scare. Who benefits? The politicians who are giving all of this money to people, the state governments that are taking the money from the federal government, disseminating it to the people of their states, and who in turn will receive the votes of the people who are receiving the benefits from the bank. This is all coming from hard-working, tax-paying American citizens. And the thing that just drives me bananas is that Christians are as eager to accept support off of the public dole as our unsaved people. You, we would be shocked if we knew what the percentage was in our churches of the Christians who are living off the taxpayer dollar. And then these same Christians and these same conservatives, they'll go to a Trump rally and they'll say, no more socialism, no socialism, no socialism. And Trump gets up, America will never be a socialist country. Are you kidding me, Mr. Trump? America is already a socialist country. <laughs> Just hand it out, hand it out, hand it out. All that is, is politicians bribing people for votes. This has exploded the welfare state. And you and I both know, once they get this kind of stuff on the books, it never goes away. There's not a Congress in the future that will ever rescind any welfare expenditure that was granted in Congresses before. It'll never go away. I, I want to tell you, I, I, mean, I mean, you talk about something to be afraid of. There are going to be far more people going bankrupt over this thing then people are going to be dying over this thing. This is going to kill many small businesses. This is going to kill many hard-working families that are working two or three jobs just trying to make ends meet, but they're honest. They refuse to accept the handouts from the federal government or the state government. They're honest, they work hard, and they, they work off of the labor, and they live off of the labor of their hands. This is gonna put a lot of them out of business. Think about the employees in these stores whose hours are now being cut, or maybe they're being laid off. Think of the jobs that are already lost. Think of the jobs that are being lost. And all this government taxpayer dollar going to the welfare state, increasing our federal deficit, increasing our deficit spending. We are $23 trillion in debt. That's before all of this expenditure began. $23 trillion in debt. And yet, we act like, well, we politicians act like they have all the money in the world just to give and give and give and give. The bankers are are profiting on this, the welfare state is the beneficiary, and thirdly, the police state. 
is the beneficiary of this scare. You know what we are seeing? All the brave patriots. We are staring medical martial law Amen. in the face Amen. right now. Amen. What they could never do under any other pretense. They've tried how many times to create a police state, and they're doing it, of course, gradually and incrementally all the time. But how many times have they tried to foist something on the people to cause them to surrender their liberties to the state? And it didn't work. But now, with a medical scare, Everybody is doing the job of the police state for them. Amen. On the whole, the American people, including Christians, pastors and churches, are happily surrendering to it. All in the name of protecting us from the coronavirus or any other risk or hardship, whatever it may be, it's, it's the coronavirus now. In years past, it was something else. When this is over, it'll be something else. Protect, we're just protecting you. We're protecting society. We're protecting your family. We have to take away your liberties to take care of you. Don't you understand? emboldened by this, oh, I'm going to quote John Whitehead. John Whitehead, president of the Rutherford Institute, perhaps the, I mentioned him last week, may be the best source for all things police state in this country. If you're not reading John Whitehead, you're, not, you're lost on this subject. Let me tell you what, let me read an excerpt. This is not all of it, but it's an excerpt. And it's about a page and a half long, so bear with me. Attorney John Whitehead. Emboldened by the citizenry's inattention and willingness to tolerate its abuses, the government has weaponized one national crisis after another in order to expand its powers. The war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on illegal immigration, asset forfeiture schemes, road safety schemes, school safety schemes, eminent domain, all of these programs started out as legitimate responses to pressing concerns and have since become weapons of compliance and control in the police state's hands. Don't go underestimating the government's ability to lock the nation down. Donald Trump said he could do it. After all, the government, oh, by the way, you, you know one of the best things you could do right now is turn off the TV and get off the Internet. Turn off the TV and get off the Internet, and you'll be a happier person by the time we meet next Sunday. I promise you. But we've seen the pictures of these Italians who've all been quarantined in their own homes, the whole, the whole nation, forbidden to leave their home. And we've see, seen videos of some of the, uh, the men and women, windows open, and they're singing. You've seen those, right? And they're singing, you know, happy. And, I, and I've seen some, oh, isn't that wonderful? So encouraging, singing from their window. Don't you know what you're seeing? Don't you know what you're looking at? You're looking at a bird singing in its cage. That's what you're looking at. Oh, wow, that, 
it, that caged bird sure can sing pretty. Oh, wow. Let's tap the cage and make him flop a little bit and put a mirror in there. Maybe he'll sing a little bit more. Oh, that bird sings such wonderful melodies. Isn't it just wonderful? Birds singing in their cages. Thank you. I prefer not to be in a cage. The building blocks are already in place for such an eventuality. Back to Whitehead. The surveillance networks, fusion centers, government contractors that are already share information in real time. The government's massive biometric databases that can identify individuals based on genetic and biological markers. The militarized police working in conjunction with federal agencies, ready and able to coordinate with federal government when it's time to round up targeted individuals. The courts that will sanction the government's methods, no matter how unlawful, as long as it's done in the name of national security. And the detention facilities, whether private prisons or FEMA internment camps that have been built and are just waiting to be filled. Now all of this may sound far-fetched to you now, but we've already arrived at the dystopian futures prophesied by George Orwell's 1984, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, and Philip K. Dick's Minority Report. On a daily basis, Americans are relinquishing, in many cases voluntarily, the most intimate details of who we are, their biological makeup, our genetic blueprints, our biometrics, facial characteristics and structure, fingerprints, iris scans, etc., in order to navigate an increasingly technologically enabled world. Nevertheless, they have become a convenient tool in the hands of government agents to render null and void the Constitution's requirement of privacy and its prohibitions against unreasonable searches and seizures. The ramifications of government, any government, having this much unregulated, unaccountable power to target, track, round up, and detain its citizens is beyond chilling. Chances are, as the Washington Post has reported, you have already been assigned a color-coded threat assessment score, green, yellow, or red. So police are forewarned about your potential inclination to be a troublemaker depending on whether you've had a career in the military, posted a comment perceived as threatening on Facebook, suffer from a particular medical condition, or know someone who knows someone who might have committed a crime. In other words, you're most likely already flagged in a government database somewhere. In the meantime, cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze. But as I make clear in my book, Battlefield America, The War on the American People, it's the American surveillance state, not the coronavirus, that poses the greatest threat to our freedom. Amen. Again, that was John Whitehead. If you think Mr. Whitehead is paranoid, Listen to this Fox News report. This was last Friday. During an interview on Fox Business Network, Senator Bill Cassidy, Republican from Louisiana, a licensed physician, said regarding controlling the virus, he was responding to that question. How do we control the virus? Republican senator from Louisiana, a medical doctor, I'm quoting, ideally you use big data. With HIPAA, that's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, with HIPAA protections, you get big data from Google, AT&T, Verizon, and you know every place I've gone. If you do that, you track my contacts. You clean down places that I've been. But then those people I have exposed myself to can be tested and then keep going until you have 
everybody corralled. That's what South Korea did. That's what Taiwan has done. Frankly, that's what we should be doing. We should be pushing CDC to make this happen. Close quote. This is a Republican U.S. Senator saying this. Use big data to completely control my environment, track my movement, anyone I've contacted to be tested, everyone to be corralled. That's what foreign governments have done. That's what America needs to do. This is a Republican. This is what fear does to people. It turns their brains into mush. And it turns their hearts into butter and their backbone into grease. Did you know that the United States Marine Corps is offering $40,000 for Marines to join a new psychological operations unit? Right now, $40,000 will be given to any Marine if he volunteers to become part of this psychological unit of the United States Marine Corps. Question, how do we know that these PSYOPs units are not being used against the American people right now? How do we know that? I received this from a, a business traveler. This is someone who travels all over the country for a living. Currently, I have to get my temperature taken before going into any business and hotel. The airports have, all have thermal imaging monitors looking at every passenger deplaning and boarding a flight to check their temperature. I have to fill out a form saying where I've been, where I'm going, and who, I'm go who I've been around. Will the temperature guns at businesses be replaced by retinal scans? Not a big jump. Will the thermal imaging monitors at airports, bus stations, train stations be replaced by facial recognition monitors? Not a big jump. You can now be tracked worldwide at every single place you visit because of this virus. Do you really think that these current government protections will ever go away? If you do, grow a brain and read about the last 50 years of history. This is a dream virus for anyone or any entity that wanted to bring the population under complete control. When people are consumed with fear and panic, they have already surrendered their liberties to tyrants. I'm telling you, if you are governed by the spirit of fear right now, you have already surrendered your liberties to the tyrants. Just admit it. You're just a slave without the chains being put on your neck, but the chains are already strapped around your heart and your soul and your mind. Oh, <laughs> can't pass this up. A Zionist Jewish rabbi this week said that the coronavirus will not go away until a third Jewish temple is built. <laughs> Ah, there you go. There you go. That's the solution.
build the third temple and boy, all the coronavirus will disappear. Man, I can't he wait to hear what Bible verses that Zionist prophecy preachers like John Hagee, Ken Copeland, and Robert Jeffers are going to come up with for that one. The Bible repeatedly tells us to fear not, stand up, and trust God. That is our assignment. Fear not, stand up, trust God. And once again, we Montanans need to stay committed to the principles of liberty as expressed in our state laws. Let me give you Montana Cone Annotated 2019, Title 10, Military Affairs and Disaster and Emergency Services, Chapter 3, Section 10-3-114. Confiscation of firearm by government prohibited private right of action costs and expenses. Chapter 3, Disaster and Emergency Services. I'm going to read sections, subsections 1 and subsection 4. Following a declaration of an emergency, Donald Trump declared a national emergency. Uh, Governor Bullock declared a state of emergency. Man, I'll be glad when that guy's gone. <laughs> Here's the law in, in Montana. Following a declaration of an emergency or disaster pursuant to this chapter, a peace officer or other person acting or purporting to act on behalf of the state or political subdivision of the state may not take a confiscation action. Subsection four, as used in this section, confiscation action means the intentional deprivation by a person in Montana of a privately owned firearm. Yeah. Our state law codifies our natural God-given right to keep and bear arms and even a declaration of emergency or a disaster or anything of that nature authorizes our government or any subsidiary thereof to confiscate the firearms of the citizens of the state of Montana. Amen. Listen to me. If the so-called liberty lovers and Christians of this country were as consumed with the way government, Democrat and Republican, is usurping our God-given, constitutionally protected rights and liberties as they are with buying up all the toilet paper in Walmart <laughs> to protect them from a virus from which they have but a minuscule chance of even getting seriously sick from, much less dying from, our freedoms would be secure. <laughs> but the fact is Americans are surrendering their liberties without a whimper. Please take my liberties. Please take my freedom. Please, please, please protect me from the coronavirus. Yes, take my First Amendment rights. Take my Second Amendment. Take my Fourth Amendment. Take my liberties. Take my freedom. But protect me! America is no longer the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's the land of the sheep and the home of the scaredy cats. Here's the, here's the spiritually, here is the spiritual bottom line. 
This is very important. So-called Christians are just like the unsaved world. They are living for themselves. It's all about them. Their security, their happiness, their protection, it's all about them. Turn with me, Matthew chapter 16. I'm bringing this to a conclusion, but this is extremely important. I began this message with give, giving you spiritual truths, biblical principles, and commands of God. I'm going to end the same way. Matthew chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever will save his life lives for his own safety, lives for his own blessing, lives for his own enrichment, will lose it all. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, in my will, under my calling, shall find it. Adam Clark writes, whosoever will save his life, that is, shall wish to save his life at the expense of his conscience. How much does your life mean to you? Does it, does it mean surrendering your conscience? Is, it means that much to you? Your physical life means that much to you? You're going to surrender your conscience to save your life? Hmm? You're going to surrender your convictions to save your life? Are you? You're going to surrender God's truth to save your life? You're going to surrender God's will to save your life? Is that how, is that how much your life means to you? It's more important than God. It's more important than truth. It's more important than right. It's more important than liberty. More important than freedom. More important than conviction. Is that how much your life means to you? If it does, you're a sorry, sorry, despicable member of the human race. Our brave forebears gave their lives their fortunes, their sacred honor, and everything else for something that was more valuable than their life, and that was the freedom and liberty of their posterity. Amen. Not to mention the spiritual truths that we have from God and the fact that we're going to eternity and we're going to meet our Savior face to face one day and we're going to give an account. That is, shall wish to save his life. At the expense of his conscience, he shall lose it. The very evil he wishes to avoid shall overtake him, and he shall lose his soul in the bargain. See then how necessary it is to renounce oneself. But whatsoever a man loses in this world for his steady attachment to Christ and his cause... He shall have amply made up to him in the eternal world. Adam Clark. Anything we surrender for Christ, including our lives, will be restored to us a hundredfold and more when we see the Lord in heaven. Do you realize that this is not the end of it? Do you realize that? Do you realize that when you die, it's not over, it's just the beginning? 
Do you really think this is all that there is? You think you're like a dog, a, a cat when you die, that's it, you're gone? No. You were made in the image of God and that soul is going to live forever and forever and forever. And in eternity, we're going to live with the decisions we make in this life. Whosoever shall save his life. It's not our job to save our life. I know God has given, all, given us all survival instincts. Don't, don't get me wrong. That natural law resides within every, every man. We all have an instinctive desire to live. I, I want to live. I have a lot to live for. I'm looking forward to God blessing me with years of life and all the things that God will have me do during that time. I'm excited about it. I'm anxious for it. I love, I love life. I love what God has called me to do. I, I'm, I, I, get, I get up every day excited about doing what God has called me to do. I love life as much as anybody. I have that same innate survival instinct that everybody has, and more than some. But at the end of the day, my life does not belong to me. I am not the author and finisher of my life. My life belongs to my Savior who purchased me on his cross 2,000 years ago. He owns me lock, stock, and barrel. It is his job to protect me. It is his job to strengthen me. It is his job to meet the needs that I need to do his will. And when God decides that my time on this world is over and he wants to take me to heaven, it doesn't matter one whit why and how he chooses to do it. Amen. What? Our lives, your life, belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to you. God gave you life. God sustains your life. And when God is ready to take your life to heaven, he will do that. And there's nothing you or I can do to stop it. And there's nothing I would want to do to stop it. We're missing this. Come on, pastors. Where are you? We're missing this truth. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. If God wants you to die with the coronavirus, God's will be done. God's will be done. It's not going to change one thing that I'm doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a job to do. I have an assignment. I have a calling on my life. And as long as I have life, I'm going to be faithful to the job that God has given me. And so do you have such an assignment. You have such a job, such a responsibility. If God wants me to die in a car wreck, so be it. If it's to die of heart disease, so be it. It, my life is in the hand of God. Am I going to do common sense things? Sure. We all, I lock my door at night. I carry a gun around town. <laughs> I'm just checking your reaction. Sure. We take, God, God, that's a natural law that God gave us. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of our thought process, our life belongs to God. Amen. Now, that, if you really truly understand that and believe that, you'll have all the courage you need to face anything you need. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. Jesus said something very similar. Matthew 10, 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Albert Barnes writes, The meaning may be expressed thus. 
He that is anxious to save his temporal life or his comfort and security here shall lose eternal life or shall fail of heaven. He that is willing to risk or lose his comfort in life here for my sake shall find life everlasting or shall be saved. Ah, so well put. You want to save your life here? Okay, God, go ahead. And then you lose it in the next life. Or you can lose your life here to Christ. You lose your life in Christ. And you can save it in the next life. It's up to you. Take your choice. Go ahead. If you're consumed with this life, if that's what means more to you than anything else in this world, fine. Save your life and go to hell. Because that's where you're headed. Because real children of God have been born again by the Spirit of God are living their lives for Christ. Amen. He is their life. Yes. We don't hold on to this life. We hold on to the life of Christ. Yes. In Him is life. In Him is eternal life. We are not here for ourselves. We are here for Christ and for his will. One final passage, Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 1. Not long after I was called to the ministry, I read these verses. And I claimed these verses for my ministry. I was 19 years old. And I can tell you to this very hour, I still claim these verses as a servant of the living God. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, fearlessness, courage as always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death for me to live is Christ and to die is gain that's what Christians are all about that's why in our founding generation, when the society was comprised of a large majority of Christian people with real preachers in the pulpits, they were willing to stand up against the threat of the loss of everything they had. They weren't intimidated. They weren't afraid, fearful. They didn't cower in fear. You know why John Hancock signed his signature in such big letters, right? He was the first one to sign. You know the story most of you do. For those of you that don't know, when he signed that Declaration of Independence Big, big, beautiful letters. And somebody asked him, Mr. Hancock, why did you sign in such big letters? He said, because I've heard the King George has failing eyesight. I want to be sure that he can read the name of John Hancock on that Declaration of Independence. And then he said, who knows, maybe he'll double the price on my head. That was the kind of courage 
those men and women had. It's because as Christians, they knew that their life was Christ's. That Christ would be magnified in my body whether it be by life, that's okay with me. Or whether it be by death, that's okay with me. For to live is Christ, to die is gain. If you don't have that, it's doubtful that you even have Christ. I think maybe the question we need to start asking these people today in our country is, do you have Christ? Do you have the Lord? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Have you committed your, your soul to the Lord? If you've committed your soul to the Lord, then how hard should it be to be, commit your life to the Lord? If I can trust my eternity with God, why can't I trust my physical existence with God? If we're truly born again believers with the Spirit of God in our lives, then to, to live is Christ and die is gain. Where, do you go, where are you going to put fear in any of that? Come on, where are you going to find fear in any of that? You're watching too much television, and you're on the internet too much, and you're listening to these sky is falling doomsayers that are scaring you half to death and you need to be in the word and in prayer and letting God strengthen your heart and strengthening your mind and walking out here in this world with all of the courage and the bravery that God can give you and show the world that there's something different about a child of God. Let me close with this. Sevilla Martin was a school teacher with a simple musical experience. She and her husband, Walter Martin, 1862 to 1935, often wrote gospel songs for revival meetings. Hymnologist Kenneth Osbeck explains the circumstances surrounding the writing of this hymn that I'm gonna share with you. It was composed while the Martins were spending several weeks as guests at the Practical Bible Training School at Leicestershire, New York, where Mr. Martin was involved in helping the president of the school, John Davis, prepare a songbook. The Reverend Martin, a well-known Baptist evangelist, was invited to preach at a church some distance from the Bible school. That Sunday morning, Mrs. Martin became suddenly ill, making it impossible for her to accompany her husband to his speaking engagement. Mr. Martin seriously considered canceling his speaking assignment since it would be needful for him to be gone from her side for a considerable time. Just then, however, their little son, little boy, spoke up and said, Father, don't you think if God wants you to preach today, he will take care of mother while you're away? Sevilla Martin then created the composition after being inspired by the words of her son. When her husband returned home, he wrote the music. The name of that song is, and it may be new to some of you because we've lost so many of the great old hymns in our churches. It's sad. We need to sing more of the great old hymns here even. God will take care of you. Be not dismayed 
whate'er be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Through days of toil when hearts does fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean everyone upon his breast. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day. All of the way, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Lose the fear. Put your faith and trust in him. Stand up like a man and a woman and let God's will be done in our lives. Let's stand for prayer.